Hello from the Center for Livable Cities and a warm welcome to the 11th episode in our CLC webinar series, Cities Adapting to a Disrupted World. I'm your host, Dinesh Naidu. Today's webinar is co-organized with the Institute of Policy Studies here in Singapore and is titled Living with Diversity, Religious Harmony in Singapore. But first, some housekeeping. Simultaneous interpretation in Mandarin is available for this webinar. To access this, please click on the interpretation tab on your Zoom toolbar and then select Chinese. We have two speakers for our webinar today, Professor Jakob Ibrahim, Professor at the Singapore Institute of Technology, will first share on Singapore's lessons in achieving harmony between diverse faith communities. Professor Lily Kong, President and Lee Kong Chen Chair of uh, Chair Professor of Social Sciences at the Singapore Management University, will highlight the changing nature of religion and its implications for managing religious groups, spaces, and relations. Dr. Matthew Matthews, Head of IPS Social Lab and Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies, will moderate the dialogue and audience Q&A. We've received questions for the professors during registration, and you can all pose questions to them using the Q&A tab. This webinar is also an occasion to launch our latest title in our Urban System Studies series. The book is titled Religious Harmony in Singapore, Spaces, Practices, and Communities. This USS documents lessons in the planning and governance of religious harmony in Singapore, covering aspects such as planning for places of worship, managing religious practices in common spaces, and cultivating community networks in building trust between different faith groups. Our speakers are also, uh, also played a part in the making of this USS. Professor Lily Kong advised in the scoping of the book and Professor Jakob Ibrahim wrote the foreword as well as gave an interview as part of the research process. We'd like to thank them as well as other urban pioneers and experts, some of whom are present at this webinar today. I'm now honored to welcome and introduce our first speaker, Professor Jakob Ibrahim. Professor Jakob is a professor of engineering and advisor to the president at the Singapore Institute of Technology. He has served as Singapore's minister in the ministries of communications and information, environment and water resources, and community de development and sports, while also being minister in charge of Muslim affairs. He also advises startups and sits on several boards of private companies and unions. Without further ado, Professor Jakob Ibrahim, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Dinesh, uh, and good afternoon to all of you. Um, let me begin with my short speech on this very important topic. Managing racial and religious harmony in Singapore requires the active participation of the people, public and private sector. The government's role in ensuring racial and religious harmony rests on four key pillars. First, by devising laws to protect minorities and uphold religious harmony. So for example, in Singapore, we have the maintenance of the Religious Harmony Act. Secondly, by building institutions to protect minorities' rights. So for example, we have the President's Council for Minority Rights, or the PCMR, that evaluates every piece of legislation to see if there are unintended biases towards a particular minority group. Thirdly, by developing policies to uphold the principles of fairness and equality. The bilingual policy in Singapore is designed to ensure that the languages of the various groups are kept alive while English is adopted as a language of use in our daily lives. Another example is that of land planning to ensure adequate space, places of worship for the various faith communities. And finally, the government undertakes various programs to bring different communities together. For example, our government launched in 2002 the Interracial Confidence Circles, or the IRCCs, in every constituency. These are groups of local, religious, and community leaders coming together to forge trust and understanding. The people sector, and in particular the community and religious leaders, also play an important role in maintaining religious and racial harmony by producing consistently inclusive messaging for the congregation. They must also help to manage the diversity in a fair and just manner. And finally, religious and community leaders help to manage inter-ethnic and inter-religious challenges through existing platforms. 
The role of the private sector is rarely mentioned, but they too have an important role to play in maintaining this balance. Their HR policies, for example, must allow for diversity of groups to be present and to ensure the various needs of the communities are met. Cross-cultural understanding must underpin how businesses operate in Singapore. Before I'm misunderstood, let me make it clear that I'm not proposing some kind of racial quotas for businesses to adopt. What I'm referring to is the need to be mindful of the diversity in your company. Advertising and media companies, for example, have the additional responsibility of ensuring that their messaging does not promote stereotypes. The key concept underlying government policy is the, is the distinction between private spaces and common spaces. As Singapore is a country governed by secular laws, racial and religious concerns cannot be taken public policy. However, these concerns must be accounted for in order to preserve racial and religious harmony. So every religious group has a right to practice their faith, but in a manner that does not undermine other groups or the national interests. The government will devise policies to account for all these differences, and each community would have to make the necessary adjustments in their practices to account for the concerns of other communities. The common space is essentially the space where all religious communities coexist and more importantly, commingle, such as in our housing estates, public schools, hawker centers, public parks and beaches. The goal is to increase this common space so as to allow greater interaction among the different communities. Private spaces are essentially the respective community spaces where practices and events take place primarily for the needs of that specific community. And the best example of this is the places of worship. These spaces are a necessary part of maintaining that balance. However, as I've argued in the past, this dichotomy, though convenient conceptually, creates a false dichotomy. The same individual cannot suddenly transform himself or herself in the two spaces. In other words, the same values and understanding must prevail in both spaces. It cannot be that we are tolerant of each other in the common spaces and yet despise each other in the private spaces. So therefore, I would argue that in trying to maintain our, soul, our, our racial and religious harmony, the education of the individual insofar as how he or she deals and manages the diversity must be the primary concern of all parties. Tolerance and understanding must be the underlying values adopted by all in Singapore in order for us to live harmoniously. And this is where the people and private sectors have an important role to play, as I alluded to earlier. At the same time, the government must be fair in all, to all communities as far as possible. Let me explain. In determining the needs of each faith community, places of worship are often cited as a good example of our government fair dealings with all communities. Every faith community is entitled to places of worship. Government can allocate land and space at reasonable rates to each faith community. But these places have to be built by each community using community funds. Government funds cannot be used to support the needs of faith communities. But there are other areas where government's intervention is necessary to maintain the harmony we have. Clearly, in egregious cases of hate speech directed at other faith communities, the government plays a decisive role in bringing those responsible to account for their actions and meeting out relevant punishments. We do not want a situation where an aggrieved faith community takes the law into its own hands. However, faith communities should play a role to reach out to the affected groups and help to soothe the wounds, and also to, to their respective congregations in highlighting the episode and lessons learned from it so that everyone can play a role in preserving our racial harmony. With these policies and programs, while these policies and programs have worked thus far, there's a need to constantly review this in the light of the changes taking place in our society. Let me share an example. The Interracial Confidence Circles, or IRCCs, grew out of the 9-11 incident and out of the discovery of a terror group in our midst. It was the idea of the then Prime Minister, Mr. Go Chok Tong, formed in 2002. The IRCCs have, in fact, played an important role in bringing together religious and lay community leaders in each constituency. So the IRCCs are local chapters of the national effort of forging trust and understanding between the faith communities. Maintaining racial and religious harmony is a work in progress. 
societal changes will have an impact upon what we have achieved thus far. Let me share three trends. First, new groups have emerged and will emerge in our midst. An inclusive approach must be the norm. However, we must not discount the impact of new groups on existing arrangements. Let me share an example which I'm familiar with. In the Muslim community, while the dominant group are the Sunni Muslims, there is a small but growing number of Malays who are Shia Muslims, wanting their own private space and sharing the common space. There are radical voices in the Sunni Muslim group which opposes the inclusion of Shia Muslims. What do we do? The second trend which bears watching is the changing orientation of younger Singaporeans towards how religious diversity should be defined and embraced. While most would welcome this diversity, there are voices among the young that in embracing religious diversity, we must be as comprehensive as possible. From their perspective, everyone who professes a religious belief, no matter how different to those in the mainstream, must have a seat at the table. Finally, the increasing role of social media in our daily lives. We have seen how social media can spread misinformation about certain groups or events across the world. The impact of this on our racial and religious harmony can be devastating. We must be prepared for this, but we must also be aware that as new technology develops, other challenging possibilities can emerge. Imagine a deep fake of an influential religious leader spreading across the world. Maintaining racial and religious harmony is an ongoing exercise involving the government, the people sector, and the private sector. But as a society, we must also move beyond tolerance and understanding. We must strengthen our racial and religious harmony by deepening our understanding and appreciation of each other's religious beliefs and traditions. Currently, there are efforts underway by various groups to understand each other's holy scriptures. The fundamental principle on which our racial and religious harmony must stand on is the respect we give to each other's beliefs and traditions as if we want others to do so for our own beliefs and traditions. And that respect can only develop if we have a deeper appreciation of each other's beliefs and traditions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jacob, for sharing your comprehensive and strategic perspective on how Singapore approaches the critical issue of religious harmony. I'm now delighted to introduce our next speaker, Professor Lily Kong. Professor Kong is president of Singapore Management University and is the first Singaporean to lead the 20-year-old institution, as well as the first Singaporean woman to head a university in Singapore. She's internationally known for her research on social cultural uh, change in Asian cities, focusing on issues ranging from religion, cultural policy, creative economy, urban heritage, to smart cities. Professor Kong was also formerly a member of the CLC Advisory Board and is a close friend of our center. Without further ado, Professor Lily Kong, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Dinesh. Very good afternoon to everyone, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share the virtual stage with Professor Jacob and to be uh, speaking at a CLC event again. Thank you. Um, today's topic is really very much about um, religious harmony in Singapore and how we live with diversity. And so the theme of the webinar focuses our minds on the relationship between religion and social relations in Singapore society, but it's a question that um, I think occupies uh, the thoughts of many uh, policymakers and leaders in many societies. In thinking about social relations, we will necessarily think of uh, three categories, and I would say uh, bonding, bridging, and breaching. Bonding simply refers to relationships and social capital within a social group or a community. And that social group or community could be defined in terms of race, language, religion, gender, nationality, and so forth, right? Um, bridging, on the other hand, is about building relationships and social capital across social groups. And I add breaching, uh, which refers to the divergence and divisions within as well as between social groups. So the um, 
um, Professor Yaakov has already spoken very much about the shared responsibilities uh, in building, bridging relationships across social groups and society, uh, the relationship that rests on the government, but also the private sector, and certainly on religious groups and religious individuals. Very often when it comes to bonding within a religious group, the responsibility rests very much with religious leaders and religious adherents themselves. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, in the next, hopefully 10 minutes, is to draw attention to the fact that, um, you know, when we think about strategies for dealing with bonding and bridging, and particularly bridging, uh, we must be mindful of the fact that religion is not an a priori category. In other words, it is not a pre-existing and immutable category. For what I mean by that is that for any one religion, you will find differences in the ways in which they are practiced across individuals, across societies. Thus, there will be differences in the ways in which, for example, Catholicism is practiced in Italy, in the Philippines, and here in Singapore. And that is because local cultural norms will inflect on you know, the, the belief system and the actual practice of religion might have certain inflections. Now, when there are uh, these differences across uh, groups, even be those belonging to the same religion, that's where there is potential for uh, divergences and divisions to emerge. And I'll come back to this later. I would also want to point out that um, there are changes in the ways in which religious practices occur over time. Uh, and some of what I will share later uh, will deal with this. What this means is that as we manage religious groups, religious spaces and religious relations, we need to be very constantly conscious of evolution and transformation. And what might have worked as a policy and a practice of management previously may not always remain relevant. And we need to be very mindful of and alert to these evolutionary changes in religious practices themselves and the ways in which religion, religious practices, even within the same faith, come into contact with one another. So our efforts cannot afford to be static. And this has been true historically and continues to be true in present times. So if we are to ask ourselves, um, you know, what are the religious practices that are changing over time and how do we begin to manage them to uh, hopefully achieve a form of bridging, then I think we need to contextualize religion within uh, the larger context of local, national, local change. And these changes uh, very often impinge on the way in which religions are practiced and the relative emphases of different belief systems. So in the shortness of time that I have, um, I'm not sure that I will be able to speak about the five uh, broad areas of global change and the potential and real impact on religious change. Um, I will just say what those five are and you know, to the extent that I can say as much as I can, I will cover two or three or four of them. Now, the five areas that I think um, confront any society today because they're really global challenges are as follows. One, increasing mobilities, the migrations of people across borders. And of course, COVID has temporarily limited um, movements of people, but I don't think that this is you know, migration and mobilities is going to disappear altogether. It will re-emerge again, and that has an impact on the ways in which religions are brought from place to place and the ways in which religious practices rub against one another. The second is um, something that, unlike migrations and mobilities, has actually been exacerbated with COVID, and that is the increasing digitalization of society, the increasing communications and, and, and travel technologies, uh, which have you know, emerged over the years. And what this means for how we learn about what's happening in something else, uh, in some other place um, instantaneously. Uh, some other practice that's going on in some other country can be brought right into our living rooms. And we pick up these practices. We um, learn these new ways of thinking and doing, and we import them into our own uh, context. 
And that then has certain implications for um, religious practice locally and religious relations as a consequence. A third area is about aging populations. A fourth is about environmental change and degradation. And a fifth is about the growing urbanization across the world. Um, more than half the world now lives in cities, but attendant on urbanization is growing social inequalities. And that too has implications for the role of religion in society. So let me take each of those in turn. And as I said, I might not cover all of them. First, increasing mobilities. Remember, I mentioned that religions are not a priori categories and practices can differ and do differ across locations, even for the same religion. So what happens is that when migration takes place, different practices of the same religion come into contact with one another. And sometimes this can lead to divergent and divisive relations. If you take the context of Singapore, for example, and this is an example that I think many people are familiar with, Singapore, the Singapore Indian and Hindu population is predominantly a Southern Indian one. And this has histor deep historical roots from the time, um, from the colonial era onwards. But when we do find that with migration, there is greater diversity within the Indian population that is now in Singapore, and that means the Hindu population that is in Singapore, the practices of Northern India and Southern India in Hinduism are actually somewhat different. The Northern Indian tradition has uh, far more by way of external influences, Mughal influence, Dravidian influences, um, uh, British influences, whereas Southern India had less of those influences. And what this means is that the practices of Hinduism differ. When that is brought to bear within the context of a Hindu temple in Singapore, that's where you begin to see differences in opinions as to what level of uh, emphasis should be placed on different kinds of practices. Um, and that potentially could lead to uh, certain kinds of uh, differences in opinion. And therefore, um, you know, maintaining the bonding relationships, I'm not even talking about bridging relationships now, the bonding relationships are impacted and need some careful management. Now, an easy answer or rather a convenient answer to that would be to say, well, why don't we have northern Indian temples and southern Indian temples and keep the practices separate? Now, that then has various kinds of implications for how we deal with other religions, because if that were to happen with Hindu religion, then we begin to think about, well, you know, um, with, with um, the way in which we allocate space in Singapore for religious places, should we then with uh, different denominations of churches allocate different spaces for de different denominations. And as new denominations or independent churches emerge, should we then uh, set aside space for different groups? And there you will have a never ending evolution, uh, which makes it very difficult to manage in Landscar Singapore. So, um, you know, there isn't time to go into a great deal of detail, but I wanted to give you a taste of the challenges when um, you know, uh, migration takes place, bringing different practices to bear even on the same religion, and then the implications on other religions. Now, let me turn to a second uh, area of uh, you know, sort of global change. And this is about increasing communications and travel technologies, um, as well as the digitalization of society. So this, this entire theme is about technology and technological change. Now, as I alluded to earlier with communications, uh, technologies, uh, sort of um, getting increasingly sophisticated and so forth, what it means is that we, we all have greater exposure to what is happening elsewhere. And this means that even without traveling somewhere else, even without spending significant time in some other context, there is the possibility that we will import practices from other contexts into our environment. And those practices may occur for good reason in other contexts, um, but what happens is it is being brought into our context, which is um, necessarily different. All societies are different and therefore need to deal with um, you know, our religious relations in different ways. So let me just cite an example of how um, some practices in other contexts might be brought into Singapore. Um, not yet, and not uh, in this context, I am um, being anticipatory in my comments, uh, 
um, not suggesting that this has happened yet, uh, but this is, this is the example of halalfication. Um, or in some contexts, some scholars call it pan -halal, a pan-halal phenomenon. And what it means is the extension of halal uh, into areas of life beyond food. Now, we're all familiar with halal food. Um, so some foods are halal, some are not. But pan-halal phenomenon or halalfication is about extending that notion of halal into other aspects of daily life, uh, including in uh, sort of uh, um, uh, daily items that you know we take for granted. So is your fridge halal? Is your washing machine halal? Is your toilet bowl halal? Um, is this pet food halal, right? And um, this, this phenomenon um, has emerged in predominantly uh, Muslim countries like our neighboring countries, Indonesia and Malaysia, but also in um, countries which are not predominantly Hindu. So the Muslim population in China is also uh, displaying some of these characteristics. Now, there are implications for how we manage in the context of Singapore, for example, if this were to happen, implications for city planning, for example. In other places, you have um, the notion of halal gated communities and the emergence of services that have exclusive clientele. So laundromats or even the internet mobile browser that is to be um, you know, used by, um, uh, that, that, that has to be halal and therefore catering to a particular segment of the population only. Now in China, this has actually incited a, a degree of Islamophobia. Uh, on social media, and there's quite a bit of push, pushback, and the state has um, found it necessary to step in uh, to deal with things, right? So, um, as I said, I, I am being anticipatory in my comments, and I don't pretend to have the answer, but I want to make the point that with changes in practices, the ways in which we manage our very delicate religious relations needs to keep in step with these sorts of changes. Similarly, with the digitalization of society, which has been exacerbated by COVID. Um, and when, you know, um, people cannot go into the religious buildings, whether it's churches, temples or mosques, there then happens to be a virtualization of rituals and prayers and so forth. And this then has implications for how we manage cyberspace. How do we, do, how do we take some of the secular practices of managing cyberspace in a cohesive way, in a harmonious way, into the religious sphere, right? At the same time, there are implications for space needs for religious buildings. Um, and, you know, moving ahead, we need to ask ourselves whether um, if we are to move in and out of pandemics and, um, you know, uh, disease X and so forth, what are the implications for the continuing need for religious spaces? Um, you see that virtualization has also touched the dead. So the virtualization of um, death rituals, of commemoration and memorial rituals for the dead. And um, this has actually been a, a positive tool for city management in certain contexts because of the lack of space in cities when um, not just cemeteries um, have to give way to the living, uh, we also have to uh, actually give way, uh, oh, sorry, if I might just uh, rephrase myself, even columbia, columbia spaces are lacking. And so, um, you know, uh, death rituals, commemoration rituals have gone online. Uh, so people deal in, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in China, um, you know, have uh, rituals where ashes are dispersed in the seas and uh, there is therefore no place for a family to go and pay their respects. And what happens then is that um, the commemoration rituals are conducted online and you can um, sort of pay your respects, uh, make your offerings online and so forth. So all this has implications for how we manage um, city planning and uh, find ways in which to keep different religious groups and their rituals and practices in play even if they are changing rituals so that everybody has a space in society. Now, I've been given a time check. It is 4.31. I'm one minute past my time. So I feel I won't be able to go into my other uh, areas, but I hope I've given you a taste of how um, religious practices do change over time and the ways in which we think about management of 
religion, religious spaces, and religious relations need to keep in tandem. So thank you very much for your patience, and I hope I've uh, been able to stimulate some discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kong, and uh, we'll have to call you back to elaborate more on aging and environmental degradation and urbanization and how those impact the topic as well. Uh, but thank you very much for your thought-provoking presentation. I'm sure it has uh, sparked a lot of discussion. And on that note, let me now welcome and introduce our guest moderator today, Dr. Matthew Matthews. Dr. Matthews is head of the IPS Social Lab, a center for social indicator research and a senior research fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies at the National University of Singapore. Dr. Matthews has been involved in over 50 research projects using both quantitative and qualitative methods to examine religion, race, uh, immigration, uh, family, aging, and poverty. Dr. Matthews currently sits on several boards and panels, including OnePeople.sg and Families for Life Council. Without further ado, Dr. Matthews, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Dinesh. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, we had some very, very uh, insightful discussions from both Professor Jacob and Professor Lily Kong, and I don't want to try to summarize all that they have said. I am sure, as Dinesh mentioned, you probably need to have them come back again to provide more, I mean, a lot more elaboration of some of what we have just discussed today. Uh, the, in a nutshell, uh, when Prof. Jacob mentioned uh, very much the fundamentals of keeping religious harmony in Singapore, some of the key challenges, uh, and of course, some of the initiatives, and Prof. Kong uh, highlighted the substantial diversity we have in the practice of religion and how our local cultural norms will inflect on the religious system and some of the constant transformations and evolutions that we need to be mindful of. So it's really a minefield of very, very rich areas of exploration that I think many of us are interested in. I'm sure you've got many questions and you'll be posing that to uh, Prof. Jacob and Professor Kong in a few moments. Uh, we also had you look at a uh, two poll questions, which I think we put it out when you're in the waiting room. And so I thought maybe it's good time to just look at uh, what the responses were like, what was the consensus uh, of that. So uh, we asked that question, uh, what do you think are the three most important elements for fostering religious harmony in a city? And if you notice the top one, which had the most consensus, was about celebrating diverse practices and heritage, which is something that I think is done very much in Singapore, but also very closely related to that. Uh, Seventy-six percent interreligious education uh, curriculum in schools, and the third one was platform for dialogue and conflict resolution. Uh, we also asked you a question uh, about how often uh, you had visited a religious site, which is not your own. I think that was the next question, uh, and. Actually, all of you who are on this um, webinar have uh, visited such a site. So it's uh, tremendous in terms of the ability to be able to uh, look at very, very different, uh, diverse kind of practice and religion. So I'm not going to take too long. Let's go straight to some of the questions. Uh, we had a number of questions which were asked of you earlier. And uh, or you put in some questions earlier. And so uh, we wanted to make sure that we featured some of those questions. So let me take the uh, first one. I mean, there were just so many questions. So we'll just, uh, we were able to pull out a few of them. Um, let me start off by a question that uh, Ang Tiao Li provided to us. Uh, the question is quite uh, very straightforward. It's how can we achieve harmonious living with relig religious premises next to housing. Uh, I just wanted to give some context here. Uh, in Singapore, we do have religious sites very close to residential areas. And generally, there are no real problems with this arrangement. Uh, but we may not always be very comfortable with that. So uh, the Institute of Policy Studies in our major survey, which we did last year, uh, we noticed that about 40% or so of Singaporeans actually uh, uh, mentioned they're actually uncomfortable about having these spaces close to their home. Um, about 15%, they're so just slightly uh, comfortable. So how can this, uh, Chow Lee asks, can we achieve this kind of harmonious living with uh, religious spaces so close to us? I'm wondering if we can have uh, both Professor uh, Kong and Professor Jakob to provide a quick thought to this. 
Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Matthews. Maybe I can start, uh, since I've dealt with this when I was Minister in Church of Muslim Affairs, with mosques distributed across the island. I think the most important thing is to ensure that that religious institution becomes part of the community. If it's isolated from the community and having its own set of practices, um, ignoring what are the concerns of the community, I think that's basically a potential for flashpoint. So in my experience, uh, we encourage our mosques to play an active part with the community centers, with the community groups. And as I mentioned earlier in my speech of the IRCCs, the representatives of the mosque sit in the IRCC so that they can discuss some of these concerns. I think we cannot pretend that there'll be no conflict, there'll be no misunderstanding. I think we must assume that it will always happen and the best way is to have a dialogue and to have understanding. I have numerous examples of how very enlightened mosque leaders have taken you know, uh, steps to change and tweak a bit of their programming to take into account uh, some of the concerns raised by their neighbors. So I, I think this is an ongoing um, sort of pursuit, challenge, and uh, the, the most important thing is we have to cultivate religious leaders and community leaders who are sensitive that these matters have to be handled in a sensitive manner. Um, we, I, I can't imagine the day when we isolate all our religious institutions at the far end of the island. I think that would not be very healthy. If anything, this will teach our children how we can live in the midst of such diversity and can coexist harmoniously. Uh, so that's my take on the question. Thank you. Prof Kong, do you have a thought? I do. Um, I, I do think that Prof Jacob's uh, point is fundamentally what we need to do. Um, and so what I, I will elaborate on is really just, um, uh, you know, well, as I said, an elaboration. Um, you know, so our planning, our urban planning principles, and I noticed just now in the poll, uh, only about a quarter of the respondents thought that planning the built environment was an important way. I actually do think that that's really important. Um, so the way in which we plan our religious spaces, I think we take cognizance of um, the need in the community and the relevance to the community. So for every X number of Hindus or Chinese religionists or you know, uh, Muslims in a community, you get amount of space so that there is some correlation between the need of the community for the religious building and the presence of that. Um, so that's one. But that's not to say that, um, you know, that alone suffices. The sorts of common um, activities that religious organizations can open up to. So, um, you know, the ways in which different religious organizations can come together to organize things that bring different groups together will reduce the kind of sense of, well, this is not my religion, why do I have that building next to me? Um, that kind of feeling. So common activities that um, extend beyond a single religion can very often uh, be a platform for bridging relationships and therefore enhancing understanding. Um, and for that, you know, I, enlightened religious leaders are very important. Uh, playing a role in influencing the flock, so to speak. Thank you. Very, 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 very insightful. I think, I think th both those responses, I think, uh, make it very clear that one is the, the willingness of religious communities to incorporate the broader community around them uh, and not kind of isolate them uh, to be able to keep that kind of harmony. I think that's uh, a few other questions were asked, which really asked about some of this attempt to have more shared spaces uh, become common uh, shared spaces in the community. So whether it's a mosque or a church having a uh, uh, childcare facility, a kindergarten facility, I think that's something that you probably have already kind of mentioned that. But I'm just wondering, are there any drawbacks? We do know that these are, are good moves, uh, but are there any problems when uh, religious sites become a lot more interested in becoming very, very community-centric? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, if, if I may sort of chime in first, I, I think it was probably around 1987 or thereabouts. I remember um, our, our late uh, minister mentor, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, um, exercising a word of caution about this that um, you know, religious places should not become the de facto community centers, devoiding the community centers of um, common activities and communal activities. Because um, you know, while these activities are good, especially if they're opened up to different religious uh, people of different religions, there can be a 
danger and a tendency to say, I'm having a, I have a kindergarten in my premises within a church or a mosque or whatever, and it's only for my religion. And therefore, what it does is it shrinks the common space um, where people of different religions and different races, etc., can come together. So um, it's a double-edged sword, and it's something that we need to, I think, constantly be vigilant about. Yeah. Thank you, Prof Kong. Uh, Prof Jacob, did you have a thought? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with what Prof Kong has mentioned. Uh, personally, I'm actually I'm not in favour um, of having such kindergarten spaces, you know, places of worship, for the very reason that Prof Kong has mentioned. Uh, but never forget that some of these spaces came about before you know, we really thought seriously about how to integrate the various communities, right? So uh, in a sense, I think we need to deal with this problem in a very sensitive manner because for some communities, they see this as something as a pride and joy of what they can do and contribute to the community. And when I was growing up, there were many uh, young people going to church-based kindergarten because at that time there was no mosque-based kindergarten. And of course, then the mosque react to that and they have their own. So, you know, it, it, it became some kind of a competition, which I personally don't think is healthy. Uh, but having said that, I think this is where the adjustment we spoke about. So when I was around, uh, we had some of us to work together with a local kindergarten in, uh, with the PCF, uh, Spark of Thoughts and all that, so that we can in a way allow our kids to go there to have the secular aspect and come back to the mosque to have the religious aspect. So some kind of an accommodation rather than asking them to close down entirely. But certainly I, I agree with what Prof Kong has mentioned. I think we should uh, try and increase the common space as much as possible. Talking about uh, common space, just thinking about bring religious groups together. Uh, I think somebody, Sheena mentioned this question about how can Singapore with its unique context learn from the global uh, space with regards to social diversity issues. And there's one space issue which uh, came to our minds. Uh, when you kind of look around the world, you see innovations like in Berlin, for instance, and Stockholm, they've got something called the House of God, or House of Religion, where you've got different congregations, Muslim congregation, Christian congregation, all using the same shared space, same accommodation. Uh, and, and this seems to be a trend in some cities. Uh, do you think this is possible, especially when we think about the way forward to optimize the resources that we have, the small space we have? And some of the global centers seem to be doing some of that. Does it work in Singapore, Prof Jacob? <laughs> Um, my honest opinion, I think it's an idea worth trying. Um, we don't do it at the expense of closing out the malls and the temples and the churches, but we try it as an experiment because I think you need to socialize the various congregations. Um, from my perspective as a Muslim, a mosque is just a, a clean place for me to be able to do my prayers. So when I was in the States, for example, people tend to forget this. There are no mosques in some of the universities. And when we had to do our Friday prayers, we were, we were actually at the basement of a church. And we had our Friday prayers there. Why? Because the place is clean. But as institutions evolve, they actually have other functions, right? So in Singapore, for example, the mosque is not just a place of worship, but it's also offering services to the Muslim constituency, constituents. So how do you manage that in such a way when you have a common space? Is it possible to have uh, places of uh, worship where you can share, but when it comes to specific services, you can have different uh, offices or something like that? I, I, I think it's an attempt worth uh, trying out, um, you know, as I said, not at the expense of what we already have, but trying out new modalities so that people can get socialized to that. I know for a fact that young people will accept it. I, you know, I have two young teenagers at home, or at least they're not teenagers anymore, they have graduated. I mean, they see the world very differently. And to them, if all of us can coexist harmoniously and still practice without harming each other, why not? So I, I think, you know, Singapore can be an innovation like Berlin and Stockholm in this part of the world. Because this part of the world is where you need these sort of creative ideas. When you have all of those extreme views coming out about my space, your space, and you, know, you don't come together. So I, I, I would welcome it, frankly speaking. Yeah. Um, so, so I am like-minded with Prof Jacob. Um, and I think we can certainly start with a, a single space for multiple users of the same religion. And then, you know, move from that to other religious groups. Um, so, you know, um, if I might just um, steal the opportunity to squeeze in my aging <laughs> comment, um, you know, as, as Singapore ages and um, as we've learned over the last several months, it is, it is possible for people to actually be doing their 
worship and participating in communal worship from home. Um, and when that, when you have an aging population, I'm, I'm making a parallel with teleconsultation. When you have to go and see the doctor, you can actually do it um, in a teleconsult way. That kind of religious practice could become more important as the population ages and people have difficulties commuting, traveling from one place to another and so forth. And so when you have that kind of phenomenon um, emerging, I mean, the elderly fam members of my family really appreciate being able to participate in a religious um, prayer from the comfort of the living room, not because it's comfortable, but because it's a challenge for them to navigate getting out public transport and so forth. Now, when that happens, you're going to find that the need for religious spaces is going to change. And um, if that were to happen, uh, actually the same space could be used by different groups uh, at different times of the day, broadcasting uh, their you know, um, rituals and their practices, and you could actually have shared space. So um, it is an innovation. It does require cultural change. Um, but that in the entire history of religion and religious practices is nothing if not change. Yeah, uh, if, I mean, since we talked about quite a bit of issues to do with space and uh, Prof Kong is even talking about virtual space here, uh, let me just also move on to the issue about uh, religious harmony since that was quite a bit of the discussion that, uh, I mean, was, uh, we heard just now. Also, there were a lot of questions about that. Uh, one of these questions that uh, I see here is about uh, faith-based issues periodically surfacing in Singapore. Uh, and this is something that uh, we've noticed, whether it's debates in uh, about forbidding tudong wearing or complaints over seven month, uh, the issue about litter and pollution. Uh, we heard quite a bit discussed by both Prof Kong and Professor Jakob about uh, how government deals with some of this. But I think here the question Justin is asking, is there a better way for both government and society to manage these outcries? aside from what some would say as being very reactive. Uh, so is there some other way of doing that? Do we kind of have a way that we seriously look at some of these issues without just taking them apart only in those seasons where they come out? Uh, either one of you, Prof. Jacob or Prof. Lily, do you have a thought on this? Uh, okay, let me take a shot at this question. Um, certainly, I think we would like to see, um, I wouldn't say a resolution, but some way of how some of these issues can be brought forward, right? Um, uh, they will keep recurring as long as some people feel that their concerns are not met. Um, I'm familiar with the Tudung issue, for example, and this is something that has been debated and discussed for many, many years. Um, and so that what has emerged, I think, within the community, which I'm proud of, is that there are groups, including from the religious community, who felt that there must be a better way in dealing with this issue. We don't having to go out and have a confrontation and a debate and, uh, you know, airing of all this in, in, in public. We could work behind the scene and work either with government, with private agencies, um, even with private NGOs on how some of these issues can be handled. Uh, and, and so I think you need to bring in the various players, to bring the various influences early on and say, how can we move this forward? Bearing in mind, of course, there are larger concerns, which we must not deny basically, right? So the seven moon will come every year. But every year when I was a member of parliament, I worked with the various uh, interest, uh, seven moon interest group to see how best they can manage their noise level, how best they can manage the pollution and so on and so forth. Some will play along with the town council, and some may not, and we have to basically go after them. So in the case of the Turong issue, we've had many engagements, many discussions behind the scene. And we know that this is something which we have to continue to work at and to find ways in which we can convince our other uh, uh, counterparts in Singapore that if we can manage this in a way whereby it can be accommodated without uh, undermining whatever major national principle that we mind, I think we should try and move the process forward. So I'm in favor of that kind of process. Uh, but, you know, I cannot pretend we can solve this overnight, right? Um, we are not a, a Muslim country, we are not a religious country, we are a secular country, and the government has to operate along secular lines, but bearing in mind these are the needs of the various community. So uh, I think that ongoing dialogue has to take place and socialization of the other people so that they understand that it's not a threat. You know, uh, if I go to a, a hospital and a Malay nurse wears a tudong, 
to me, I should judge her not on her tudung, but on her professionalism, like whether she can do the job or not, basically, right? And I, I think these are the kinds of things that we need to sort of talk and have a conversation that people understand. That that lady wants to be a nurse, wants to be able to give care because she, you know, is it, in her soul and DNA to be a nurse, but she wants also to practice her belief. So how do you balance the two in such a way that she can continue to uh, be a professional nurse and yet adhere to her religious belief without undermining whatever concerns that we may have in society. So that, that, that's my take on the issue. Thank you. Prof Kong, uh, you have a view? Yeah. Um, I'll, so I'll be quite brief in the interest of time. Um, I'm an educator and I therefore am very much uh, firmly a believer that we need to continually do the public education. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that I would use the word reactive to describe the, the way of managing it. It's an ongoing way of management. Uh, it's an ongoing way of explaining uh, why there are some of these practices. It's an ongoing um, process of um, you know, bringing on board people to understand. And I think there's no getting away from education. And I don't mean formal education as in we must have religion as a subject in school, as much as it is about um, informal education, public education, um, social education that goes on. Um, and, um, you know, the learning journeys that uh, students go on to understand about, you know, different religious groups, different practices, why for a certain period of, of the year you will have this, um, and you accept and embrace it, not just tolerate it, because it is actually something that is, um, uh, I, I actually think it's something to be celebrated that we have a society of diversity and that we're able to, um, you know, live alongside one another with our different practices. But it doesn't happen just like that. It, it needs continuous conversation, dialogue, education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, following closely, because I think we are talking about the whole theme of how negotiation happens. Um, and, and of course, how the state is involved in this. Somebody just asked this question. Uh, how should authorities weigh between maintaining secularism and listening to the concerns of religious groups via social media or online platforms about activities held in Singapore. Uh, what are the steps involved and motivations behind the eventual decisions? Uh, I don't know whether about uh, whether both, uh, the professor Yako can give us all the like, take of it. Whether it's uh, more sure for you to do that, but certainly, I mean, we would love to clean on some of your thoughts uh, on that, and also Professor Kong. I know she's served in various communities in this area. So, any thoughts about this? Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, uh, I can't go into too much details because I'm still sworn to official secrets act <laughs> of what happened behind the scene. But, you know, I, I'm very candid and I think our government is always very concerned and very keen to find ways in which you can move this process forward. You know, I mean, it, it's not in the government's interest to block or stop various groups from doing what they want to do, you know. But at the end of the day, there are larger concerns, right? Um, I, I, I think... That negotiation that Prof Kong mentioned earlier is an ongoing process. And I, I think we have gone very far, you know, in this process since the days of when we started after 9-11 and after the GI um, uh, terror group that was uncovered, that today we have a very vibrant uh, group of community leaders that come together. I know for a fact, at least the former Mufti, and I'm sure the current Mufti, has on his phone the personal numbers of the Archbishop, the various deacons, the various monks, and so on and so forth, and they talk to each other on a constant basis. Similarly, they, have in, they are in touch also with government officials when issues emerge, basically, right? And I think they understand that we are in this together, and we have to maintain this sort of a secular approach to what we have in Singapore, but bearing in mind that there are various religious communities that also want to try and not necessarily push, but also want to try and ask for some space for their own concerns, basically. Uh, I, I don't pretend that we can resolve this overnight, right? But, you know, I, here I like to borrow a quote from my good friend, uh, Ambassador Zainal Abidin Rashid, who, you know, who I think captures what we have in Singapore, uh, the best way that Singapore is a secularism with a soul, in a way that we are a secular society, but we understand the religious needs and religious concerns very deeply, and that we cannot ignore that, basically, you know? Um, I can't go into the details of the many times that I've interacted with M.M. Lee Kuan Yew on this issue on some of the concerns he may have. But at the end of the day, deep down, I think they are, you know, uh, concerned about how we can help every community move forward, yet at the same time maintaining their religious traditions and beliefs. Um, 
So that's the best I can do in answering that question, Dr. Matthews. <laughs> well, Prof, Prof Kong, since you're not in the government, maybe you can give us a <laughs> on your thoughts about since Prof, Prof Jakob can't say a lot of things. But what, what do you think? I mean, there have been over the last few years petitions put up by different religious groups, maybe not officially as groups, but maybe just religious people, whether it's about a concert, whether it's about uh, issues to do with certain kind of um, sexuality and rights. So what do you think? What, where, should we, uh, where should the government get involved? Um, so I, I do think that um, there is no getting away from it, that there are, um, there are moments when government must get involved because you do need the arbitration uh, in society across different groups um, and the state has the responsibility and is well positioned to do so. Uh, having said that, I, I do think that it's important that we don't, um, or the state doesn't um, lean over too much in terms of um, listening only to what's going on in social media or to petitions. Um, in social media, you get an echo chamber uh, and you uh, get a slice of uh, very vocal uh, voices. Um, but the silent majority very often um, may have a position that is not necessarily reflected in social media or in the petitions. And therefore, it is the role of the government, I think, to reach out and have that sense of what different segments of society are thinking and not to be overwhelmed and railroaded into um, taking the views on social media or through the petitions only. Um, so, so that would be my uh, contribution to this discussion. I think that's very, very insightful, Prof Kong. I, I think it just probably leaves us to know that policymakers in religious groups and everybody need to do quite a bit more learning what is going on in the community, whether it's at the neighborhood and how to better serve it and make sure that we're not intrusive. But, and also uh, for policymakers to really get a, a good sense yeah. of what very, very different diverse groups have in mind. Uh, I realize that we really don't have time for any more <laughs> questions. And I think we had very, very good questions. I'm sure more and more would want to uh, find out more, but uh, this gives me a great opportunity to have all of us give a virtual clap to <laughs> Prof Kong and Professor Jakob for very, very insightful comments and thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Jakob Ibrahim, Professor Lily Kong, and Dr. Matthew Matthews for that candid uh, discussion on this important topic. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and thank you for sharing your time and perspectives with us today. Our next webinar will be in two weeks, but on a Friday on the 6th of November. Our webinar is titled UN Habitat Helping Cities Through COVID-19, and it will be organized with UN Habitat. Executive Director of UN Habitat, Datuk Maimuna Mohammad Sharif, will give a keynote on how UN Habitat has been working with cities to fight COVID-19. Our panelist, Dr. Mahamud Adnan, Mohammed, County Executive Committee Member of Health Services for the Mandera County Government in Kenya, will also share on how their experience working on share on their experience working with UN Habitat. Our guest moderator for this session is author and urban strategist Dr. Zahir Alam, who is also a WCS Young Leader. This webinar will also feature the renewal of the MOU between Singapore and UN Habitat, which will be signed by Ms. Indrani Raja. Minister at the Prime Minister's Office and Second Minister for Education and National Development, and Datuk Maimuna. Please register to attend using the QR code. This webinar has been live streamed on CLC's Facebook page, and we will up upload a recording of it tomorrow on our CLC YouTube channel, where you can find almost 600 other videos, including videos on the topic of living with diversity. Finally, thank you to you, dear viewers, for your participation. We hope you find these webinars useful. Before you leave, please use the QR code or link to fill in our feedback form. Do tell us what works and how we can do better. We've come to the end of today's webinar, but we will be leaving this room open for another five minutes. So feel free to use the chat box to exchange comments with each other and with the speaker and moderator uh, who might be able to stay back for a few minutes uh, to, to interact with you. Until our next webinar on the 6th of November, Goodbye and stay healthy.